from point A to B. I don't have point A and B in this one. So just tell me the horsepower required for this pump. Okay, just that. I see two students notice it. Maybe the rest of you didn't start yet. Did you? Probably not. Uh, this homework is it's very straightforward. Okay. However, in the example we have for water, the calculation for water. But this one is for oil. Okay. Let's go back to the equation itself. If you recall, this is a equation to do the horsepower calculation, right? Overall mechanical energy balance. Look at this carefully. The unit of edge is feet, right? It's in feet. The unit of pressure is in feet, okay? So the rest, this thing is also in feet, right? Correct? So everything has to be in feet, otherwise if it's not the same unit, you cannot add them together. Okay, you may notice F V square L over 2D G sub C. That is minus dp dl, okay, divided by density, right? Rho. So it's a pressure doppler unit length per density, okay? So in the example that we have, you see the way that we do the substitution, 0, 85, 0 something, that is for the case of water. So we say water, and that's the density of water and viscosity of water. What's the horsepower required for pumping water? This equation that you see is not just for water. It's work for any fluid. But if the working fluid is water, <coughs> pressure in height, pressure in feet that we get will be feet of water. Okay? So this edge that you see, see that H2 minus H1 is a unit of pressure. It's a conversion, it's kind of have a conversion from PSI to feet of water. Uh, senior, how do we convert from PSI to feet of water? Multiply by what? Divided by what? Zero, zero, something. Uh, this kind of thing you need to know during the exam, okay? And just to re remind you a little bit, maybe I can increase the font size. So we have Pressure is rho g h, right? And this rho is typically we put bound mass per cubic cubic foot. Okay, and g is what? What's the unit of g? Feet second square. Is that what it is? So feet per second square. And dash is in feet. And whenever we do this, typically we divide it by G sub C, right? G sub C is conversion factor 32 pi, what? 32 pi, what? 4? 32 pi 2 something? 5 something. Okay, 5 something. Uh, and the unit is bound mass, feet, per second square power force. You agree? Okay. So when you when we do this, look at this part. You see power mass and that power mass, they cancel each other. So I put that as one and that as one. Okay. You see this uh, foot and foot, it cancel each other. So I just delete it. Okay? I just delete it. And that foot, 
it cancel with that, and that become square foot. Okay, g value is thirty two point two two. So the numerical value of that and that they cancel each other. Correct. Second square and that second square they also cancel each other. Okay. So what do I have left now? So I have rho and bar force. So I put bar force. I flip it on the top. Then I have rho multiplied by h with the unit of bar force per square feet. Good. And we can change that to bar force per square inch too. What What do I do? Who else? What's What's your name? Tristan, how do I convert from power force per square feet to power force per square inch? <coughs> Divided by 144, right? So now, you may notice that <coughs> if we put rho and just edge, that will give us, divided by 144, that will give us uh, PSI, okay? But edge alone, is not PSI yet. Okay. So in the equation that you have seen over there, it's just delta small h. It's just height, right? So if I have this divided by rho, then I get some kind of just height. And height has a unit of feet. Correct? So what I try to say is whatever I get over there is going to be, of course it's height, but is it height of water? True or false? Basma, is that height of water? Yes or no? Yes or no? Maybe, maybe it's zero, okay? If you, if you say yes, that's minus two, okay? Is height of whatever fluid that we are using. If we use oil, that is going to be height of oil. Okay. If we use water, that's going to be height of water. Make sense? What we do is this term is a pressure drop per unit length, right? And we multiply by L, so it's a pressure drop. Pressure drop has typically pressure drop has a unit of psi something, right? But we divide it by density. And we divide it by density, so of the working fluid density. If you see the, the unit of this equation is the, the pressure per density, right? And we use the same density everywhere. If we use water, like in this example, in this example it's just water, so it's no trick. It's not that tricky, right? We just use water. Whatever you get, it is feet of water. But in the homework, it's oil. So whatever you get is a feed of oil, right? Make sense? If you get confused, you may do the homework two times. Use SI unit and fill unit, okay? And compare them. It must be the same, okay? And in the homework, you should not make that um, um, mistake anymore, okay? The, P1 and P2 that you get is in height, but it will be height of oil, or height of mixture, or whatever we use. You see H2 minus H1? That's a height of the liquid, the difference in height of liquid that we use, okay? So, an equation, not yet, okay? What if the fluid that we change, the fluid that we use, keep changing with distance, okay? What should be that height? Hey, can it be H2 minus H1? Kind of, but not quite correct. Okay. Why do I talk about that? Okay, let's take a look at question three. Question three is about discretization, right? We have flow up and to the right. That's case one. Case two is flow to the right and then up. So when we flow up, what happened? 
I said some gas bubble expand, but we still have flow of mixture. Okay, and in the hint, I show that uh, you may calculate the the density and viscosity based on the hole up, and hole up is just a volume fraction of the liquid phase. Okay, so if the area occupy 70% by liquid and 30% by gas. So the whole up is 0.7. Good? So that is the way to calculate the uh, mixture density and mixture viscosity for the case of gas liquid. If you have oil water, you can use this equation for oil water, but you cannot use that new equation for oil water. For oil water, I give a different equation. And for oil water, it go up um, exponentially, is it? Yes, for oil water, we have um, <coughs> this different equation, equation for emulsion itself. Good? Okay, let's go back at the governing equation. What happens when the fluid that we use keep changing with the distance? In this equation, we have pressure drop. When pressure drop, gas coming out. When gas coming out, the density change, right? Gas expand a little bit. So we need to use full form, okay? Don't divide it by density. To do it very correct, you may multiply density everywhere, okay? Multiply rho. And when it's with V2, it's rho 2 V2 squared minus rho 1 V1 squared, okay? When it is with subscript 1, it's rho 1. When it is subscript 2, it's rho 2. You got it? So the full form will be, one half rho two v two square minus rho one v one square divided by g sub c plus rho two h two minus rho one h one okay plus rho two p two p two in height okay minus rho one p one and that p one is in height that p is not actually pressure it's a pressure per density. So when you have pressure per density multiplied by density, it's just pressure, okay? And multiplied by rho over here. Oh, actually this one is a total work. And if you have pump, you multiply by rho. What rho do we use? To be correct, you may use rho average. But in that question, it doesn't have pump, okay? W hat is zero. For the question number three, when we just go up and to move to the right, it doesn't have the <coughs> pump, right? So it doesn't have work done on the system, okay? So this term is just work done on the system. Minus, and that will be rho what? Rho average at the middle, okay? It's not rho one, it's not rho two, it's rho one plus rho two divided by two. What about E sub V? Is that rho one or is that rho two? Or is it rho average? It has to be row average, okay? So this means question three. Question three, mm, it's too long to put on the exam, so I put it over there in the homework. In the homework, you use Excel to do it. I said discretize it for session, right? One, two, so half of the upward direction and half, uh, two sections for the horizontal flow. So when it go up, just half, what do we have? So, I think I write over here. We know, let's say the middle point we call A prime. Okay? So we know density, and we know pressure, and temperature at point A. Okay? Based on pressure and temperature, we can calculate density of gas, right? Then we can calculate pressure drop within, from A to A prime. Once we know the pressure drop, we know the pressure at point A prime. Then we can calculate, I think this thing is explained over here. Okay. Try it. And you probably need to go see Arya tomorrow at 11 to 12. Okay. Tomorrow there's an office hour dedicated for you guys. Okay. And you should go see him. If you can do just half, it's fine. Because each question worth four part. If you do just half over here, you have two plus four plus four, you get 10. It's okay, right? Good. Okay. I expect more questions from all of you tomorrow. Okay.
first step, just take a look at it and try to do it first. Maybe question one, if you're okay with eight, you just do one and two, okay? So let's start with um, metering. We have several kind of detector or meter. It is important to get it accurate. A little error, like 1% over here. I say I have 1% error. Look at what happened. Let's say I have 1% error of 300 million standard cubic feet per day. So 1% error is 3 million standard cubic feet per day. At the price of $1 per MSF, then we lost about $1 million per year. It's a lot. So we have to measure it correctly. Okay? The most common method, uh, 1M mean 1,000, okay? 2M mean 1,000, but 5 by 1,000 is 1 million. <coughs> when people say S, that is standard, right? It's not just, it's not enough to say standard. You need, you always need to say what is that standard, okay? Need to specify the absolute pressure and temperature of the standard condition. And we will provide the reference for chapter 6 for you to do the charting. My reason is different press use different standard. For example, Texas use 14.65. Okay? The temperature is the same. The temperature is 60F, but pressure standard is not the same. Okay? That at Texas. Uh, if I move to somewhere else, oh, Ohio, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, use 0.65. Okay. What if I go on the mountain? I want to go on the mountain, Colorado. It's not 14, it's 15.025. It's more. You see, the pressure standard is not the same. So when someone sell you the gas, let's say from somewhere in Colorado, and they say standard condition. You need to know that standard condition over there and in Texas, it's not the same, okay? You need to make sure that you ask what is that standard pressure. And for the temperature, I know that it is a little bit. Many of us use 460, right? It is kind of 460. But over the period of five years or something, this row of, uh, row of error may, may, may be important, okay? So if you do the actual work, you have Excel, use the full digit, okay? And the value of pi, okay? If you need the value of pi, do you use 3.14 when you actually work? No, don't do that, right? Use pi, open and close parentheses in Excel, or 3. more than just two digit, okay? Meter. Okay, this one that you see is rotameter. We put something in, okay, to uh, decrease or obstruct the flow. So this ball in the middle, it will, due to the flow, it go up a little bit. Okay, there's a force going up due to the flow. Due to the weight of itself, it moving down. Okay. So the balance between that tell us how fast it is, okay? That's one, of, one way of measuring flow rate. And this is for gas, okay? This will tell me some kind of gas flow rate. Is this detector good? No, not that good, right? It's, it's okay, but most of the time, we need to, to know more. It may be able to use for somewhere close to the surface pressure, okay? Um, what time is it? What time is it? 11.28. 11, oh, okay, it's 11.28. Damila, uh, please contact her so that we write your name in so that you're not missing, okay? okay. Maybe just late. Thank you. What? 
Different flow, flow meter. We have orbit meter, venturi meter, elbow meter, nozzle, um, rotary meter, ro rotameter. It's not high accuracy. It's not something for high accuracy, okay? We don't use it for high accuracy, but it gives me something. Different flow meter work differently. The most commonly used long time ago for gas is orbit meter. For now, if you have high flow rate, the common flow meter is Coriolis flow meter and AO Smith. Okay. What I want you to know is how Coriolis flow meter work. Okay. You will see in the video, but before we go into the video, Coriolis flow meter measure mass flow rate directly. In addition to that, it measures density. Okay. Based on the mass and density, we can know the volumetric flow rate. If we know just mass flow rate okay, of gas, okay, who else that on that day? If we do your already right corner. Okay, behind you, what was your name? Austin. Austin. If I know just mass flow rate of gas. Can I calculate standard cubic foot per day? Yes or no? If I know just mass flow rate of gas, like power per minute, can I convert that to standard cubic foot per day? No. What information do I need? Density? Do you need density? Do you need standard temperature and pressure will be given. But if I don't know density, can I calculate uh, standard cubic foot per day? Yes or no? No. Austin said no. Okay, next Austin, what's your name? Sterling. What? Sterling. Sterling. The question is, if I know mass flow rate in power per minute of gas, I don't know the density, but I know standard pressure and standard temperature, can I calculate? Uh, flow rate in a unit of standard cubic feet per day. Yes or no? Yes. Yes. But he said no. I don't really know, so. <laughs> I trust him over me. Oh, you okay. Okay, next. What's your name? Caleb. Caleb? Mm -hmm. Is it yes or no? Can we do the calculation? Honestly, no. So you prefer to not say anything? Yeah, I'll go with both your answers. <laughs> oh, okay. Next. Ho. Oh. Yes or no? Can we do the calculation? Co. Co. Yes. Can we do the calculation? I, I don't know. You don't know. Don't know is zero. If you say no, is minus two. Okay. If you say yes, that's plus two. Okay. Please improve your answer. If we know the mass flow rate in power per second, and we know the standard temperature and pressure, we can calculate standard cubic foot per day. Okay, we can. Yes, we can. If you cannot, minus two. If you don't say anything, just zero. It is better than minus two, okay? Good. How do we do any of that? So next, what's your name? Ahmed. Ahmed. Uh, if I know the mass flow of gas in power per minute, how do I get standard <coughs> cubic foot per day? I said we can do it, but how do you do it? Before you graduate, you need to know it, okay? It may not be in the exam, because I put it in on exam one already. Too many unit conversion already, but now I hesitate. Afshin, how do I do that? If I know power per minute, how do I get standard cubic foot per day? PV equals That equation give me what? What do you try to get from that equation? You need to write it down. Don't do that when you have the interview, okay? <laughs> so, yes, you use PV equal to Z and RT. Set Z equal to 1, then uh, we can calculate the density. N is mass over molecular weight. The molecular weight of um, A is, what, 29 or something? So, you can calculate. Yeah, maybe, maybe you need to know the density a little bit. 
Okay. After we know the specific gravity, okay, maybe maybe Austin is right. We may need to know the specific gravity. If I know the specific gravity, then I can calculate the, the density. Okay. When I know the density, then I can convert from mass flow rate. Oh, do I need to no. Then I can I can tell how much is uh, flow rate in cubic foot per day for one bow. Okay. Then I can convert from power per minute to standard cubic foot per day. Let's watch the video. The thing that we want to get from video is what is the measuring uh, technique used in each of these. Okay, Coriolis flow meter is based on the pipe vibrating, oscillating. Okay, and something else, the one that you want to focus maybe just Coriolis flow meter, but let's watch all those. Have you ever witnessed this phenomenon? When a hose filled with water swings, it does not twist. But when a water flow is turned on, the water is forced through the swinging hose. The hose twists as a result of the changing angular velocity in the curved hose. That's the Coriolis effect in action. A rotor bus operates on this principle to deliver the most accurate measuring results. See for yourself. For practical exploitation of this principle, it is sufficient for the two measuring tubes to perform oscillations on a small section of a circular path. This is achieved by exciting the measuring tubes with an electromagnetic exciter in its first residence frequency. When no mass is flowing, the two tubes oscillate symmetrically. But when a mass flows through the tubes, the tubes deform proportionally to the mass flow rate. This deformation is registered by two sensors and forms the basis of the measuring result. A phase shift occurs between the first and the second sensor. The mass flow rate is derived from this phase difference. Should further the density of the media need to be determined, it is simply computed by evaluation of the oscillation frequency of the measuring tubes. Good. So the density uh, is density of viscosity measured by the frequency. Density? Further the density of the medium. Density, right? So density is how fast it oscillates. So when it's out of phase, we know how much is the mass flow rate. Inside there's a tube oscillating. When there's no nothing flow, every, everything oscillates at the same frequency. When there's something flow inside, it becomes our phase. Okay. Mm. Make sure that you can explain about working mechanism of the flow meter, especially for Coriolis flow meter. Working on a restrained gas application with a Coriolis meter. First, what does the meter actually measure? Second, what are the sources of errors? As with all meters, Coriolis meters are only capable of measuring what goes through them. If the process fluid is a mixture of liquid and gas, then we accurately measure all mixture properties. We measure mixture mass flow, mixture density, and mixture volume flow all properly. In applications involving liquid flows with small amounts of entrained gas, mass flow meters have an inherent advantage. Users typically want to know the liquid quantities, not the mixture quantities. In the case of mass flow measurement, the mixture mass flow, which we measure, is nearly identical to the liquid mass flow because the mass of the gas is negligible. The same is not true for density and volume flow. For example, if two barrels of oil and one barrel of air flow through a volumetric flow meter, the meter will simply measure three barrels and thus will over-report the amount of oil. Now let's discuss the errors associated with entrained gas. The primary source of error from entrained gas in Coriolis mass flow meters is called decoupling. There are other sources of error, such as compressibility, but decoupling is dominant. Decoupling happens when the fluid inside the tube doesn't move exactly with the flow tube. 
When that happens, errors occur, which are dependent on meter and fluid properties. In the case of single phase flow, there is only liquid inside the tube, and the center of gravity, the green square, moves directly with the center of the fluid. So all is well, and there is no error associated with decoupling. However, in the case of two-phase flow, the bubble can move separately from the liquid, which ultimately causes the center of gravity to move separately from the flow tube center of gravity. And in the case of high viscosity, because the viscosity grabs onto the bubble, there's very little motion of the actual bubble and therefore very little motion of the center of gravity. So we have very small errors. In the case, however, of two-phase flow with low viscosity, it turns out that the bubble can move further on each oscillation than it could when there was higher viscosity. And what this causes is even greater error inside the tubes because the fluid is moving separately from the tubes. In the case of high frequency, low viscosity, you basically have a worst case scenario. In this case, decoupling is the greatest and the bubble moves further than it could in any other scenario. Therefore, the errors are the greatest. While Micromotion manufactures meters with a range of frequencies from low to high, our low frequency elite meters are recommended for applications involving entrained gas, as they are usable over a much larger range of gas volume fractions than a high frequency meter. Aside from having a low vibration frequency, Micromotion meters improve immunity to entrained gas by employing a state-of-the-art transmitter with the latest in digital signal processing algorithms. This plot shows the performance of a Micromotion Elite Coriolis meter in a typical entrained gas application. The y-axis shows percent mass flow error, and the x-axis illustrates average gas volume fraction. Typical applications have less than 1 or 2 percent gas volume fraction. Laboratory data shows that for water at a flow rate of 250 pounds per minute, measurement performance of better than 1% is achieved with volume fractions of less than 5%. All flow meters have problems with the drain gas. For example, turbine meters can overspin and cause damage. All volumetric meters overreport by at least the amount of entrained gas. For example, a volumetric meter overreports liquid quantities by 5%, if 5% gas volume fraction exists in the pipeline. Elite Coriolis meters have the optimal geometries and state-of-the-art electronics to be able to mitigate errors caused by lower levels of entrained gas. Okay, the big one, you see this big one? Just have the op. The big one, it costs a lot. I have seen not the largest one, like this one, it can be like $60,000. Okay. The one that uh, I think at the, the one behind over there, that looks like a small one. It's like $10,000 range. Maybe $9,000, maybe $23,000 or something. Okay. Bigger is more accurate because it has less vibration. Okay. If we have a little gas in, there's a, because the frequency is small, so the center of gravity and the, set, uh, and the pipe is at the same location. But bigger is also more expensive. Okay? It's going to be $60,000 easily. But think about this. If I have gas, let's say 1% gas. Okay? So I sell my oil a little bit more. Does that matter? Just 1% more. I just use the flow meter that do count the volume, so it's the count the, just the volumetric flow rate, right? So you have 1% more. It's not quite matter if it's not much, okay? We may not be able to justify why do we use a expensive flow meter, okay? Like the cost of flow meter may cost a lot more than the, the error that we have. But if we have like large flow rate, okay? Very high flow rate. Of course, a little error, like if we have just 1% gas or something in oil, it can be more than $1 million per year. Okay? And the flow meter is just $60,000, so just buy it. Okay? It's, not, it's not that much compared to $1 million per year. 
Good. Can you be? Do you be able to describe the working mechanism of Coriolis flow meter? Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, I I will know next time maybe. Uh, there are some other flow meter that I want you to be aware of. Okay. This one is cheaper than Coriolis. Coriolis is the most expensive one. <coughs> Smith meter MB series turbine meters are designed to accurately measure a wide range of crude oils, particularly higher viscosity crude oils, which are beyond the capabilities of conventional turbine meters. The unique two-bladed helical design reduces the boundary layer effect of higher viscosity crude oils on the open area of the meter, thus increasing the meter's measurement range. The meter is also less sensitive to wax and particulates found in crude oils. Its high accuracy measurement rugged construction, and wide flow range make Smith Meter MB Series turbine meters a cost-effective solution for crude oil measurement, especially when paired with a Universal Performance Curve Compensator, UPCC, for viscosity compensation. Helical turbine meters, like conventional multi-bladed turbine meters, are inference-type meters, in that they infer the volumetric flow from the axial fluid velocity and the cross-sectional area of the meter. As the turbine meter housing is cut away in this animation, we see the two-bladed helical rotor. The rotor is constructed of titanium, which was chosen for its lightweight, high tensile strength, and excellent corrosion resistance. The flow stream, depicted by the flowing blue arrows, is channeled by the upstream skater through the rotor. The rotor, like conventional turbines, rotates on a fixed shaft with a virtually frictionless, highly polished tungsten carbide bearing system. Okay, it's very good, of course. Do we use it on the lag unit? Yes? Do, do we use it on the lag unit? You want to say yes? Yes, we use it on the lag unit. Raise your hand, raise your hand. It may be correct. Oh, we, we don't use it on the lag unit. Okay? Do we use it on the lag unit? So next is Taylor, right? Do we use it on the lag unit? No. No, why not? Um, let's let's watch more video and you see. No, we don't we don't use it on the lag unit. It's not that accurate, right? It didn't it didn't count volume by volume, okay? So on the lag unit, we need we don't use turbine meter. We use another type. We use a uh, similar one, but it's a PD. This one is not quite PD. It's a it's infer from the velocity on the the speed that is spin back to the volume, right? It doesn't count volume one by one. Okay. The rotational speed of the rotor is directly proportional to the axial flow velocity of the fluid. The fixed shaft tungsten carbide bearing design is the same as the bearing systems used in the Century Series turbines for over 40 years in harsh crude oil service. A high strength permanent magnet is embedded in the tip of each blade of the rotor. As in conventional turbine meters, a pickup coil is located directly above the rotor and is completely isolated from the fluid. It is constructed of many coils of fine wire that are wound around a core of paramagnetic material. As each blade passes underneath the pickup coil, the passing magnetic field induces an AC voltage in the coil, which is seen as a sinusoidal wave. The sinusoidal wave is then converted by the preamplifier into a square wave pulse stream, as shown. The MB series turbine meter can operate with a conventional preamplifier or with a UPCC, which incorporates a built-in pulse chronometer. So it's convert the number of rotation into the volume, okay? That's what it is. The next one, different type, Smith meter. Positive displacement meters are still the most prolific custody transfer meter in the world. Custody transfer, we use rotary band PD meter. Okay, rotary band PD meter is if we have some gas and train, um, you may use a more expensive one depending on how how much we produce. So the more expensive one will be Coriolis flow meter. 
but Smith, Rodney, Ben, PD Meter also work on the lag unit. Okay. They, since they directly measure volume, they are also one of the most accurate and reliable meters for measuring the volume of petroleum products. They measure volume directly by continuously separating the flow stream into discrete volumetric segments and precisely measuring this volume in a calibrated measurement section. In this animation, we see a Smith meter rotary vane PD meter in operation. As the transmitter, calibrator housing, and cover with transfer gears are removed, we see the heart of the meter, the rotary vane design. The fluid flow enters the meter on the left side. The block at the bottom of the meter separates the inlet from the outlet and prevents the fluid from bypassing the measuring chamber. Instead, it is channeled around the rotor into the measurement section. The fluid is continually separated into discrete segments in the measurement section. The path of a single fluid segment is highlighted in yellow. As the measured fluid segment is discharged from the meter on the right, the rotor cover is removed, and we see the blades rotating around the shaft. The blades are extended and retracted as the blade rollers follow the profile of the stationary cam. The fluid flow drives the rotation of the rotor and blade assembly in a continuous sequence. The rotor assembly is connected to the meter output shaft by a gear coupling. Each revolution of the output shaft, therefore, represents a precise volume that has passed through the meter. The external gear train changes the meter volume into the preferred measurement unit, such as gallons, barrels, or liters. The output shaft can be directly coupled to a mechanical calibrator and counter, or as illustrated, into a pulse generator. So this flow meter is not infertile. It's directly counting the volume passing the meter. Okay? Rotary vein is one of the flow meters used on the lag unit. Okay. Orifice, nozzle, venturi. So this flow meter is calculation of the flow rate based on the pressure drop. Okay. The most diverse substances are transported and distributed in piping systems every single day. They can include solvents and chemicals, oil and gas, or steam for energy transmission. The fluids flowing through pipes often have completely different properties. Therefore, different principles for their measurement are required. One method is flow measurement, based on the differential pressure principle. Some 300 years ago, Swiss mathematician and physicist Daniel Bernoulli discovered the direct relationship. You want to memorize the name? Daniel? Daniel Bernoulli? Bernoulli? So I show the picture and then you tell who's that guy. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's too much. Maybe that's too much. Okay. The pressure but and he looked like that. Fluid flowing in a pipe. <laughs> Italian physicist Giovanni Battista Venturi also performed Venturi. experiments on flow. And in 1797, he built the first flow meter for closed pipes, known as the Venturi Dunes. Here is how this measurement method works. Differential pressure flow meters have an artificial restriction integrated into the measuring tube, illustrated here by the example of an orifice plate. Two holes are located in the pipe wall, one before and one after the orifice plate. Two separate tubes connect.